I am actually talking about two things, but they're interrelated. Um, the first one is a course that we offer in the spring on energy policy. It's actually energy policy agencies in California and the West. And this is related to an internship opportunity that we also have in the spring. So um, for the first one, the course is required for everybody who is accepted as an intern. And then we generally have about somewhere between four to five openings um, in the course for additional students. And those students who are interested, the best way is to contact me or um, uh, my co-teacher, uh, Professor Bruce Kane. Um, Bruce could not be here today because he's um, with one of our sophomore colleges in energy. Um, but that's the way we do it. If you do want to get into the course and you um, are not an intern, there's no formal process. You just track us down. We'll ask you a little bit about your interests and see if we can get you in. So let's see, to move this, am I gonna to touch this? Okay, so here's an overview of the course. Um, first of all, can I ask how many people have heard about what's going on in San Francisco on climate this week? Good, okay, it's the Global Climate Action Summit. Do you know who's sponsoring it? Just shout it out. Governor Jerry Brown. And he started off the week by um, signing two incredibly important, um, uh, one is a piece of legislation, a new law, and the other is an executive order. The first one is SB 100, which moves California beyond any place that anywhere is going, that it's not just committing us to get to very high levels of renewable energy in California, but actually commits that our electricity in the state is going to be carbon neutral um, within 22 years. So it's an incredibly um, uh, aggressive goal, but those who have studied it believe we can definitely do it, though we're looking for additional technologies be to be developed. The second thing that he did was that he signed an executive order that commits the state overall to be carbon neutral. Um, by I believe it's 2045. And the important thing is the first bill is basically saying our electricity sector is going to be carbon neutral. It's the second bill that encompasses all the sectors, um, transportation, our industry, um, uh, our buildings, as well as electricity. And so this is to say, if you are interested in how energy relates to climate, um, congratulations. For those who are not Californians, you're in the right state. And Stanford is right in the middle of this. And so this course is really giving um, those who participate in it a very good understanding of how these, what are these policies and how do they get translated in, into real act, actions and what are some of the challenges. So the way that we've structured the course, this will be the fourth time it's taught is it's an in-depth analysis of the role of California Western state agencies uh, driving energy policy development, technology innovation, market structures. That California is not only the lead in clean energy, but it is these types of policies that have delivered billions of dollars of new technology and investment. And so one of the things we're trying to do for the students at Stanford um, including those who may not be completely focused on energy, is how do you develop some literacy in policy? And how do you understand what these people are doing in government, how it can open up opportunities for new technology development, how markets and market structures are really important of moving ahead and achieving success. So the first one is, okay, what's going on other than you hear or read about some, something in the press? The second one, which we're very excited about, is we bring in mentors from the internship program that I'm going to talk about, as well as experts. And we, again, because we've done this for four years, we have um, a really good relationship with the people who come in and talk. 
Um, just details on the course, it's just one unit, it's pass, no pass, um, and it does meet Saturday mornings, three Saturday mornings, but we give you lunch, um, but that's because it is mandatory for the interns, so we want to make sure that it wouldn't impede or conflict with any of your other coursework. So we've organized it that there are three separate sessions. The first is looking at the agencies themselves. Who are they? What are their roles? Uh, uh, Bruce Kane is an expert on uh, political science, so he has a great overview of what the California legislature is like, how has it changed over the decades. And um, then we also talk about impacts of changes um, politically. Next year is going to be really interesting because we are going to have a new governor in California, probably Gavin Newsom. So the policy won't change directly, but he is quite a different person from Jerry Brown. Um, we also will have changes in the leadership at the agencies because they're political appoint appointees. So it's going to be interesting to be able to talk next spring about how are the changes we're seeing with the new governorship in California. Um, the second session is devoted strictly to energy and climate policies. In California, energy is done to achieve the state's climate policies. So we make sure that we teach, first of all, what are the climate policies, and then understand how the energy policies fit in. Um, there's an excellent consulting firm founded by Stanford graduates called E3 that is um, located in San Francisco, and they do the modeling uh, called Pathways for all the agencies in California setting their climate goals and energy goals. And they come in and give the um, students really a great in-depth understanding of the type of modeling that happens. And I will say it then helps develop some great relationships um, with E3. And then the um, third class is what we call development of the 21st um, energy system in California in the West. So you can think about the first part is you're understanding just who does what at the government. The second one is you're then understanding what are the laws and policies. And then the third one is, OK, given that, what are we doing to actually have a um, uh, transformative electricity system that's reliable, that's affordable, and that is meeting these really groundbreaking goals? And um, for that, we get the people who are actually operating the grid come in and talk about it. So. Um, the class we added in last year and we'll be doing again this year is that we form the students into agency teams. And um, unless you're in this, you're not going to recognize these acronyms, but they're the agencies, the Air Resources Board, the Energy Commission. Um, if you take the course, you'll know by the end you know, what these stand for. But basically, you can think about you're in teams um, uh, as if you were within an agency. And so for class one, the teams then get together and they give just a short overview of their particular agency responsibilities. And then if they are an intern at that agency, they then talk about what they see as um, what they hope to be accomplishing their opportunities um, in the internship. And then the second class, um, uh, which was quite successful this time, is that I worked to identify a policy um, that was particularly challenging for the agencies. And the students had to then go in and actually read up about what was going on in the policy and then present their ideas on how they would try to actually implement the policy. So it's, again, having them start to think about a policy isn't much good if it's just a press announcement. But what are you going to do to actually um, try to implement it? So this is just a listing of the guest speakers. Um, we uh, always have had somebody who's a senior advisor to the governor. I'm sure we'll have um, somebody again this year. We um, run an internship with the Western Interstate Energy Board, which is located in Denver. And Mari Galbraith, the head of it, always comes out. He'll come out again and talk about sort of the whole Western United States and what's going on. I talked about the modeling. Um, Tara Weeks, who was a student here, graduated with her master's in CEE. She's now at the Energy Commission, an incredibly important role as a senior advisor. And um, last year, she came in and talked about transportation electrification. In California, um, we have a very large and very important state water project. 
we have a lot of hydroelectric, which is incredibly important, not just for having our system continue with electricity, but with the droughts, its operations are changing dramatically. And we place two interns um, in that agency as well. And so we have um, the leaders in their um, uh, power and risk office come to talk. And then, as I said, we have um, uh, somebody from the CAISO who really gives the up-to-date explanation of what are the new market products that are being developed because we're changing our grid so much with renewables coming on with all the intermittency um, that we have basically about every quarter brand new tariffs and products and services coming out from the CAISO. It's, so it's a great way to understand what they're doing. Um, now I'm going to switch to the second half. The first part was just an overview of the class. And the reason why we developed this class was we wanted to make sure that the interns um, who are accepted into this program go to the agencies and are truly successful and have a great time. And um, this is a picture of the um, interns and some of the speakers. Um, uh, last time around, we, there are 12 internships that we've offered across six different um, agencies and organizations. I'll explain it in a minute. The are located, most of them are in Sacramento because that's where state agencies are in California. Um, but we also have two at the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, I was a commissioner there uh, several years ago. They're located in San Francisco. And then we have two um, in Denver at WEED, the Western Interstate Energy Board. And then we are looking to expand it this year to an incredibly important organization in the world of electricity, uh, WEC, which is the Western Electricity Coordinating Council. Uh, they are located in Salt Lake City, but they have access, if you're big into data, they have access that is confidential to the operations of the entire Western interconnection, which is the Western grid, um, especially what's going on with the renewables. And so those students who um, are accepted will sign um, non-disclosure agreements, but they're going to get a bird's eye view of what's going on with the changing grid in the West that frankly is not available um, uh, publicly. We have um, incredibly diverse projects. We work with what we call the mentors. Within each agency, there's an identified person who is hosting the intern. And because this is our fourth year, we've got great relationships with them. Um, we do a lot of feedback, a lot of evaluation. And those mentors identify um, basically this fall what are the projects that they want the students to be working on? And so we get a really good variety of different types of projects across the agencies. Um, this is a project that's sponsored by Precourt, um, but also um, the Bill Lane Center for the West, and then the um, Haas Center for Public Service dash um, Stanford in Government. Because as I said at the outset, um, it's a program that is open to both undergraduates and graduate students. Um, and each of the specific application opportunities does designate whether it's for a graduate or undergraduate student. So these are our um, host organizations, the Air Resources Board, which in California establishes all of our climate policies and implements them. Um, they are particularly interested now um, in pushing forward on transportation and uh, sustainable transportation, transportation electrification. Um, an example of one project a couple of summers ago was that the student um, compared what was going on with policies and programs and funding in China, Europe, and California to make recommendations back to the board as far as what could California do beyond what it was already doing and looking around internationally. Um, we have increasingly focused on what the students are doing is they're doing a discrete concrete project that the agency will then take and it'll be presented within the agency. It may be presented publicly, but that the agency then incorporates and uses the product. So if I had to leave you with one thing, these are not internships where it's just sort of you're hanging out and can you fit in or not. We spend an incredible amount of time 
ahead of time, identifying the project, working with the mentor, making sure that the students show up where they're very well prepared. They go and visit the um, agency before in the spring before they even show up so they know where they're going to be sitting. They get to meet people. They work um, uh, very closely within the whole organization throughout the summer. They present the product. And then the agency itself then uses that product for the types of decisions that it's making. Um, so completing it, I've talked about Western Interstate Board. Um, the California Energy Commission is um, very, very important in the state of California. It sets its policies. It also does all of the building standards, a lot of the efficiency standards. It's the main agency working with the Air Board on um, transportation planning. Uh, and the level where we place these students is at the very highest level, that these, the internships are with the commissioners of the agencies for the CEC and PUC, and those are the five people who run the agency and make decisions. Um, uh, with the WE that's working directly with the executive director, um, with uh, the Department of Water Resources, I said it's with the lead of their office on risk planning. And then we're um, looking to add, as I said, um, the uh, Western Electricity Coordinating Council. So um, the goals, we again are pretty concrete about what we're trying to do. Um, we are basically looking for substantive students who want to be involved substantively in working with these organizations. Um, but we're also looking at this as career opportunities. And I think of it as twofold. One is if you're sort of thinking maybe I might want to actually work in government, this is a way to get a flavor of what is it like to work in government. And overwhelmingly the feedback is, hey, before I went, I thought government was maybe lazy, a little bit bureaucratic, but now that I'm there, I understand these are really cutting edge issues, people work hard, et cetera. So it's an opportunity to explore um, what's, what's it like to be in government. But equally important, even if you never step foot in government offices again, it gives you an understanding if you're interested in energy, how government impacts. And energy is different from a lot of other things like your phone is just your phone because you have private companies who are out there basically just pushing technology. What's happening in energy with this transformation from coal and even gas to renewable energy to thinking about carbon is that is pushed a great deal because we've had policies that say that's the direction we want to go. And then along comes, luckily, a lot of technology, a lot of innovation from companies. So if your goal is, once you're done with Stanford, to start that startup and just have a great technology that's going to change the world, it's really important to understand how that can fit in with government. I mean, you can have the best technology in the world, and unless it's something in energy where government has said it fits within our view of what's needed, you're likely not to get anywhere. So this is a great opportunity to just understand that linkage between the private sector and government. And then the last one, again, is you, you actually network a lot and you develop really great um, connections. One feature of the program is that for the students in Sacramento, they host lunches at each of the different agencies they're at, because there's five um, in um, uh, Sacramento. And we operate the interns as a cohort. So no matter what organization you're in, you'll be invited to the lunch at each of the other ones. And that's when there's presentation by staff and others within the organization. So you get a great overview of all the different entities um, in Sacramento. And one of the favorite parts of it is when you go out to the CAISO, the independent system operator, and you get to see the control room, because that's where you see how we're actually managing to keep um, the grid operating with all of the wind and solar coming on. And they give a wonderful explanation about how does this actually work when the sun goes down and the wind's not blowing. Um, this is, I'm going to just quickly um, go through an example of um, three from this very summer. The students are required to put a blog out. 
And um, we're also now posting um, products that they've done. This was Sheila Gao, who worked at the um, California Public Utilities Commission with one of the commissioners, um, Cliff, he's right there in the purple shirt. And um, she, um, you can see what her, what she um, uh, did work on, but I um, had lunch with Cliff um, uh, a few weeks ago and he said, Sheila was the most amazing intern I've ever had. And he's had a lot of interns and he said, it's like she got inside my head and could figure out what I was trying to think about and do before I even recognized it. And this is just an example of um, the Stanford students, you guys, you really do impress these people. And they gain such confidence that they have you start doing work that they then are presenting um, uh, publicly. This is um, another example, Madur. He um, was at the California Energy Commission working in uh, directly with Commissioner Hope Shield, and um, he's gained his doctorate in material science and engineering. Um, he hadn't really done much in, in, in energy, and certainly not energy policy, but he decided, hey, I think I'll just try this. And he's turned out to have a, um, uh, a great summer, and he was looking at um, this whole idea of renewable integration. How are we going to keep the system reliable as we're bringing more and more renewables online? Um, this is a third one of um, Sierra. She was out at the um, CAISO getting her master's in CEE. And um, she, I can't remember the specific project, again, the blog's online, but I remember that she basically was given just a huge amount of data that they had never been able to have time or resources to analyze. And so a lot of what we do is take the students here who have really good skills in data analytics, and they get data that otherwise is not necessarily publicly available, and they're able to clean it up and then really get some great insights that help the um, organization. So I'm gonna end with just one of our um, most exciting um, uh, efforts that's happened, and this was with the um, organization in Denver, WEEB. And this was in uh, uh, the summer of 2017. We had um, two stu students, Ben and Max, who went there. And it was this publicly available database of 15 years of historical data that they cleaned it up and they built a database. And it was, we actually have about 600 fossil-fired coal and natural gas plants in the West. Um, because it's hourly data over 15 years, it literally ended up with 75 million data points, a massive database that they built. And what they took on as this project during the summer was, what do we know about the changing coal generation in the West? And they taught it different ways through machine learning and algorithms, and I don't have time to go into it, but the top, the blue, is what you think of as traditional baseload plants. And that's what most people think coal is doing, simply operating as baseload. And that's what it started off. But this was sort of at the end of the 15 year period that they analyzed. And they have this for every year over 15 years. And this ends about 2016. Is that they then discovered that there were, in fact, lots of different profiles. And that what we have is that coal in the West now operates in very much a variable pattern. And it's not, uh, it's changed just dramatically. And we have many units who actually are not operating that much. This was presented in a webinar. Um, the agency actually used it in comments that they filed um, to the Department of Energy and to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, basically arguing against this plan that we should prop up coal plants um, through subsidies to keep them operating, saying, look at these didn't stop operation because there was some mandate to stop it. They just changed their operation because of the economics of what's happening, that we do see natural gas came in much less expensively than at the start of the 15-year period, and we started to have renewables. So this is the type of research um, that gets used and had an impact. And this is another um, uh, type of graphic that they put together for the webinar, which is 2001, the dots are what was going on with coal, where you can see the size of the dot, um, and it doesn't show up well, but actually the color is how much did it operate 
um, in that year. And then you can see what happened by 2016. Just the actual operation of our coal had changed dramatically. And it's taking this type of insights and being able to present it that really, really um, is why people love the interns coming, because nobody had actually looked at this database before our students. So what happened um, after that is that um, Stanford and the Precord Institute for Energy and Bits and Watts, our initiative on the 21st century, was very generous and they gave an additional grant and we also gave some money. And so we expanded a research team. And so for the past year, we've had a very um, large scale effort of doing what we have relabeled YDAP, the Western Interconnection Data Anal Analytics Project. Um, we've um, brought in looking at emissions analysis as well, working with um, Professor Benson and one of the um, master's student, Austin Park. We've done um, a lot of looking at the change in renewable generation. We've, um, I shouldn't say we, the students have done this. Um, they have developed a toolkit, which we're just getting ready to post on um, the Bits and Watts website that will then give access to people around the West, around the country, around the world, to the types, uh, to the 75 million point database to really understand how things have changed. And we started to do a few webinars and there's just tremendous interest because we've taken this basically indecipherable database of what's going on and you can now click on any of the 600 fossil fire plants and understand how their generation has changed over 15 years, how have their emissions changed, how has efficiency changed. Um, and then the last one that I'm very excited with is we think that we'll um, have this continuing in a graduate seminar um, where basically working with WEED, there'll be some research questions vetted and identified, and then students will be able to go in and learn this database, increase some of the visualization, but then actually um, spend a quarter or even a couple of quarters uh, doing research, doing papers, and presenting it in webinars that'll be jointly sponsored by Stanford and we. So this is also something, um, uh, an example of how we've taken this internship program and really tried to bring it into a larger research um, picture here at Stanford. So if this is something you're interested, um, separately from the internship program, um, we can you know, get you information about it. So finally, um, to learn more, Katie is right there in the back, um, who is our outreach manager for the internship. Um, you'll start hearing more about it this fall. Um, applications are due January, February. We do interviews, it is competitive. Um, internship decisions, oftentimes the agencies actually do want to do an, inter an interview either in person or over the phone. You then have the uh, seminar course, and then the um, internships are for 10 weeks from June to August. So that's it. I don't know if we have time for a question or two. Okay, then next person up. Or... <laughs> Thank you.